Good afternoon, everyone. This is Pospo welcoming you to the first of a multi learning webinar series. Five Tuesdays, five clinical scientists, and me for half an hour discussing what else? The pandemic. It has changed everything. I mean, look around you. We're trapped between these four walls for over a month now. Look at this beard. I mean, look outside your window. The whole planet brought to a standstill by this tiny little thing with the not that fancy name, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2. I read somewhere actually that you know, if a virus was a small coin, then an average man would be 200 kilometers tall. Did you know that, Tom? You didn't know that. So Dr. Thomas Pollack, my friends, one of the most promising clinical scientists out there. A NIHR clinical lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience here at King's College London, but also a psychiatrist in training here at the Monsley. If you had the chance to read any recent paper on encephalitis and all things are very new, most probably his name was figuring somewhere in there. And that's why he represents psychiatry on the scientific advisory panel of the Encephalitis Society, the world's biggest brain infection and inflammation charity. Now, before we kick off, just to say that you can ask as many questions as you like here in the chat room. Now, will you get answers? Mm, we only have half an hour, but what we will do, we will collate all your questions and try to answer them after the session. So, Tom, I'm a bit confused. So what does a respiratory virus like the SARS coronavirus 2 have to do with the brain? Tom, I'm afraid I cannot hear you. I don't know why. Oh. Can you hear I'm me now? Sure everyone else can. Can, can, can you, you hear again? me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Fantastic. Okay. So I'm, I'm sorry. No, that's oh. not your fault. Something with my computer most probably. It's okay. Okay. So Tom, um, you recently published a paper in the Frontiers in Psychiatry. I mean, it's titled couldn't be more relevant nowadays. So schizophrenia and influenza at the centenary of the 1918-1919 Spanish influenza pandemic. Mechanisms of psychosis risk. So, so not only this is not the first time the world is facing a pandemic, but the title alludes to a link between viruses on the other hand, on one hand, and psychosis on the other. So can influenza make you psychotic? Uh, yeah, well, uh, when, when we wrote the paper, which um, was not too long ago, with a, a fantastic MSc student, Ada Kempinska, but also with uh, Professor Sir Robin Murray, uh, Bob Yolkin, who's been working on the in links between infection and uh, psychosis for many decades now, Tony Vernon, who's a, a geneticist working in, sorry, uh, works on animal models of this area, Conrad Iepi, who's a geneticist, we had no idea that it was only going to be a few months later uh, that all these issues were going to suddenly become center stage. Um, to answer your question, yes, I think influenza can make you psychotic, but I think we have to ask a little bit about what we mean by making you psychotic. Uh, there's lots of evidence now that it's not just influenza, but other viruses, indeed bacteria and uh, uh, protozoal infections can all increase risk uh, for the development of schizophrenia. But if we're focusing on the pandemic uh, viral infections like we are today, um, there are two main pathways that are important that I want to talk about. And the first are the so-called acute psychoses of influenza. So these are people who are uh, have an acute uh, influenza infection 
and who either during the time of the infection or shortly afterwards become psychotic. And the Spanish flu in 1918-1919 was the most sort of comprehensively described series of, of these kinds of patients. And then there's this other um, uh, role that pandemic influenza has played really in, in, in our understanding of psychiatry. Um, and this is the observation that um, children who were born uh, during pandemic years or, to, or uh, children who were born to mothers who uh, contracted influenza while they were pregnant are at an increased risk of developing schizophrenia. And as an idea in the history of psychiatry, this has been enormously influential. Wow. So tell us a bit more about the past. I mean, I have to say, uh, I'm a bit cross with you. I mean, no mention of ancient Greece in your paper. I mean, you know, Greek doctors always tend to think that what we call, you know, psychosis nowadays were physiological in nature. I mean, okay, they sort of must have talked about infections at some point. I'm pretty sure they also ascribe voices to gods, uh, but that's another thing. So, but let's let's fast forward now to the Victorian times. Well, yeah, I mean, actually, as as you say, the the. The phrase, in, the word influenza, comes from the Italian uh, to, to influence. And historically, yeah, I'm sorry, Italian, not Greek. Uh, but, uh, historically, it was thought to uh, be related to the influence of sort of uh, astrological uh, influences. And today, we think of influenza as this sort of respiratory infection that comes in seasonal yearly forms, which we can get vaccinated. And then uh, occasionally we get these pandemic infections. And, and these happen when you get a, um, a transmission from an animal to a human and then human to human transmission. But you don't actually need to go back that far to realize that the older conception of, of influenza was far, far broader. Um, and you know, in the 1700s and the 1800s, there are descriptions from England of influenza being related to neurasthenia, to melancholy, to hysteria, to, to insanity. And these are all kind of concepts that you'll find modern equivalents of in, in today's psychiatric lexicon. Uh, the 1890 Russian influenza pandemic, um, well, when it hit Italy, there was this very strange um, disease called La Nonna, which was a kind of sleeping sickness, uh, which people thought at the time was associated with influenza. But to get to the sort of the, the, the period where, where this is most apparent, you've got to go to 1918, 1918, uh, 1919. Um, and throughout the world at this time, uh, the Spanish flu was taking hold. It affected 500 million people worldwide and killed, uh, the best estimates suggest around 50 million people. And psychiatric hospitals appeared to see this kind of sudden upsurge in cases of acute uh, psychosis associated with influenza infection. And there's one classic paper from that period by Carl Menninger uh, from the Boston Psychopathic Hospital, uh, as it was called. And he describes 100 patients who presented with these acute psychoses of influenza in just a three month period. I mean, just thinking of how many patients that is, that's, that's huge in, in the second half of 1918. Um, and they all presented to the same hospital. And he describes them in great detail. And um, a third of them present with this sort of delirium type picture with acute psychotic symptoms as well. Another third present with what's called dementia precox, which is the, the older term for schizophrenia type presentations. And then a third was, were a bit more sort of uh, assorted and, 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 and various different kinds of presentations, including perinatal presentations and, and manic uh, presentations as well. But what he was able to show in a follow-up paper uh, five years later is that of these patients who were dementia precox or apparently schizophrenia, about half of them had got better. And this, this wasn't meant to happen. This doesn't happen with the concept of dementia precox, which was sort of meant to be this kind of chronic, degenerative uh, condition which you didn't get any better from. So the fact that this was happening and some of the patients were getting better with this kind of toxic psychosis, as it was called at the time, actually it was the be beginning of a sort of dent in the sort of Kraepelinian therapeutic nihilism uh, that psychiatry sort of had at the time. And in many ways, it was the start of immunopsychiatry. Hmm. And, and what about this, you know, this, this really, I mean, mysterious entity, this, this thing called encephalitis lethargica. I mean, I've been reading about it, you know, people have been asking me about it. I had a couple of referrals over the years where, you know, it was suspected, but to be honest, I've never actually seen one. Yeah, so I think, I guess it must have been... It must be very strange being a psychiatrist working in 1918 because not only are you dealing with the sort of acute fallout of 
of the First World War, so you've got the traumatic stress-related syndromes, probably a lot of shell shock. Then you're dealing with these yeah. acute psychoses of influenza that have been described. But then on top of that, there's this other pandemic of encephalitis lethargica. And it's a really strange disorder. Nobody really knows exactly what caused it. Um, it was thought to probably have affected about a million people uh, worldwide, somewhere between one and two million. Um, and it was first described by Von Economo. What's interesting is that it was probably described a little bit before the outbreak of the Spanish flu. But for a very long time, it was generally assumed that it occurred as a sort of sequel to uh, the Spanish flu. Um, in fact, Von Economo, who first described it, he, he thought it probably wasn't caused by the Spanish flu, but, but the idea became very popular afterwards. And it was this disorder that was described by um, hypersomnolence, excessive sleeping, um, uh, extrapyramidal uh, signs, so sort of sometimes Parkinsonism, um, ocular gyric crises sometimes, and then so often severe psychiatric symptoms. Um, and some of the forms had about a 50% mortality. And one of the reasons we know about uh, this disorder, it's so sort of famous, um, is because it often developed into this kind of chronic uh, post-encephalitis syndrome, where you would see patients with uh, chronic psychoses, chronic personality change, uh, obsessive compulsive type symptoms, and most famous of all, these chronic catatonic patients or chronic Parkinsonian patients. And these were described by Oliver Sacks uh, in his book, uh, Awakenings, which was made into a film with Robert De Niro and, and, and Robin Williams. Um, and so these patients were, were still sort of filling up the asylums right into the 60s, uh, I think. Um, the question is whether influenza was involved. Um, and it was not until the 90s that uh, the influenza virus was, was sequenced. Uh, and it's a fascinating story about how that happened. Uh, it involved scientists going all the way to Alaska to an Inuit burial ground where they found bodies who had died in 1918 who were buried in the permafrost. And they took their brains out and they sequenced the, uh, the virus from that. But then we're able then to look at the brains of patients with encephalitis lethargica to see if there was any evidence of influenza there. Uh, and they couldn't find it. But I guess what that doesn't mean is that encephalitis lethargica wasn't some kind of post-infective, yeah. possibly even autoimmune condition. Well, okay, enough of the past. So let's get a bit more contemporary now. So one of our future speakers, so Michael Benros from Denmark, uh, who is going to be joining me here virtually on May 19. So he published a paper back in 2011. So his team conducted a nationwide uh, study back in Denmark using these beautiful population-based registers uh, looking into autoimmune diseases and severe infections as potentially risk factors for schizophrenia. Now, the results were pretty impressive, I have to say. It is interesting to note, though, that they hint that their results may be related to immunological reactivation of you know, less severe infections earlier uh, in life or be the results of a maternal infection that could permanently alter the peripheral immune system of the fetus. So what does this mean about pregnant women during this pandemic? I mean, should they be worried? Well, yeah, it's, 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 it's an important consideration. Just to provide a bit of the sort of the scientific context to this, um, I think in the 70s or, or 80s, there was when, when in the sort of the early days of really large scale psychiatric epidemiology, there was this finding that uh, people who were born in either winter or early spring were at increased risk uh, for the development of schizophrenia later. And um, in 1988, Sarnoff Mednick, who's a psychiatric epidemiologist, he wondered whether perhaps this might have something to do with, uh, with infection, with se seasonal infections. And, and one way to address this was to look at pandemic infections. And there was this 1957 Asian flu pandemic, which affected the world greatly and caused a large number of deaths. And he looked at patients who uh, were born in the 1957 pandemic and compared them to patients who were born in previous years and looked at the relative uh, numbers of schizophrenia diagnoses. And he found that there were more schizophrenia diagnoses in those patients who were born in the pandemic year. And this was a really important finding and, and there was a num many, many attempts at replication uh, of this finding. And it had a huge effect really because it fed straight into the development of what was called the neuro, the, the neurodevelopmental theory uh, of psychosis. So again, I think I've alluded to the fact that this kind of Kraepelinian idea of schizophrenia as this kind of chronic degenerative disorder which begins in adulthood 
This was already beginning to be challenged a little bit because of early genetic findings, findings that obstetric complications increase the risk for schizophrenia, and then now this finding that these infections, even before somebody is born, can increase the risk of schizophrenia. And what it made people realize is you had to be looking right back to the beginning of the lifespan um, to find out what causes schizophrenia. And it also raised the possibility of prevention of schizophrenia at a kind of public health level. It's also fed into a huge area of neuroimmunology called maternal immune activation uh, paradigm, whereby animals are sort of infected with influenza and they're, when they're pregnant and, and, and their offspring then go on to develop these abnormalities, which look a little bit like what we see in neurodevelopmental disorders, schizophrenia, sometimes autism spectrum uh, disorders. And that's taught us a lot about the way that the developing brain responds to inflammation. Um, the work that Michael Benrose is going to talk about, I think in a few weeks time, is really important because I think he's shown fairly convincingly that actually it's not just influenza that appears to increase this risk. It's probably not specific to any one virus. And in fact, the work in this maternal immune activation model suggests the same thing, but it's probably a non-specific effect of, of inflammation. Not only that, but it's probably not schizophrenia, which is the only thing for which risk is increased. It's if you believe the work from Denmark and it's done on huge populations, then actually probably your risk of developing most, um, most psychiatric disorders is increased by this kind of exposure. So it, it, the effect on the sort of development of psychiatry and, the, and, and thinking about psychosis can't be underestimated. To get back to your question, when it um, At last. In, terms of the advice, in, in terms of the advice to, uh, to pregnant women, I think you know, the government have suggested uh, that uh, they be regarded as a vulnerable group. Uh, we know that outcomes when pregnant women have coronavirus infection are uh, reasonably good, reflecting the, the, the general age of, of women when they become pregnant. There have been some very tragic stories, however, and there does appear to be evidence of vertical transmission of the virus. So I think all the, all the evidence suggests that we should be cautious. Um, there is no reason to sort of panic and assume that there are going to be these awful neurodevelopmental outcomes in the future, but I think the correct tone and the one that the government in the UK at least is striking is one of caution. Hmm. Now, I know that your passion, okay, at least you know, one of your passions is uh, autoimmunity, uh, encephalitis and the link with psychosis. Now, for people in the audience not familiar with these terms, so autoimmunity is when your body attacks your own body and essentially produces antibodies that attack your own cells. Uh, and encephalitis is essentially an inflammation you know, of the brain. Now, there has been recent evidence uh, from papers, you know, from even from New England Journal of Medicine, you know, from JAMA, that COVID-19 may also present with neurological complications. And to be honest, you know, even here at King's College Hospital, uh, we have noticed delirium to be a common occurrence among these patients. So do you think that you know there may be any link between the virus that causes COVID-19 and psychosis? Okay, I'm yeah, from, from the early days of the pandemic, there have been these reports of neurological disorders associated uh, with the infection. And we've just been doing a sort of a systematic review of all the studies that have come out so far. And there are uh, my colleague Matt Butler has been leading on this, and there have been about 25 to 30 studies, uh, most of them in preprint form rather than in published journals, all talking about the neurological associations. And, and what we're seeing are encephalopathies, sometimes mild, but sometimes very severe, like uh, acute necrotizing hemorrhagic encephalopathy, stroke-like presentations, which may relate to underlying vasculitis or coagulopathies, um, encephalitis, even meningitis, um, and then more peripheral manifestations like Guillain-Barre syndrome, which there seem to be very quite a lot of cases of. And we know from all the previous pandemics that where these neurological uh, manifestations tend to occur, we tend to see neuropsychiatric manifestations as well. Now, it's very difficult when it comes to ascribing causality here, right? Because how do you know in somebody who presents with a neurological or neuropsychiatric presentation that it's the coronavirus that's causing it. Uh, we have all kinds of criteria to establish causality, things like the Bradford Hill criteria, but it's very difficult because it could be the direct effects of the virus, uh, a sort of secondary effect of the immune response to the virus, or even some sort of post-viral kind of potentially autoimmune uh, phenomenon. And that's 
just the neurological disorders. But once you start thinking about the psychiatric disorders, you have to think more broadly. And, and you know, in a pandemic, the world is sort of under siege from, from anxiety, from paranoia about infection, uh, from the effects of isolation or of uh, reduced health service provision. And so the possibility for all these kind of psychosocial factors to feed into um, sort of psychiatric presentations like psychosis, like mania, like catatonia is huge. And it's probably a question of over-determination here. So but having said that, we are seeing, you know, what appear to be a number of interesting psychiatric presentations, um, particularly things like complicated deliriums or unusual deliriums, uh, psychosis, catatonia have all been reported. And uh, with colleagues at the Association of British Neurologists, uh, Benedict Michael from Liverpool University, um, they have set up a uh, case reporting system uh, where people can report uh, cases of presumed neurological infection in association with COVID in infection. Uh, and with them and with Royal College of Psychiatrists, we have now set up a similar reporting system for neuropsychiatric manifestations. And we would encourage absolutely all psychiatrists where possible uh, to report any suspected neuropsychiatric uh, presentations associated because it's really important to get this data now so that we can be uh, prepared and kind of to know what it is that, that, that we're dealing with really. I mean, really, really good. So, so people can just, you know, uh, log into this website and report neuropsychiatric complications, right? Yeah, that's right. The, the study is called Coronerve, C-O-R-O-N-E-R-V-E. Uh, I think we have a link that's going to be sent to all the delegates here. Uh, and again, it's not about being sure that you that coronavirus caused this presentation, because as we said, it, it's very hard to establish that. But it's just about logging these, these cases. It takes about two to three minutes maximum uh, to log these cases, and we'd be really grateful if you did. I mean, it seems that Marco is already on it. She's already sent, you know, the link to the attendees. So, 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 so people out there are hearing about inflammation and immune processes. Now, would it be unreasonable to think that there may be some potential benefits in relation to psychosis from the flu vaccine? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh... Yeah, I guess the, 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 the benefits of the flu vaccine can't be underestimated. They're obviously enormous. Uh, there's overwhelming evidence that both the seasonal flu vaccine uh, and pandemic flu vaccines save huge numbers of lives every single year. Um, and particularly, you know, the World Health Organization describes um, pregnant women as, 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 as a vulnerable group. And in this country, we, we give the influenza vaccination to pregnant women. Um, there's no good epidemiological evidence that this decreases the future risk of psychosis in the offspring. Uh, but there's good theoretical evidence and some animal uh, evidence to suggest that, that a similar thing uh, could be happening. Um, so absolutely, you know, we, we, these are very important sort of uh, strategies in, in, in potentially trying to reduce long-term consequences, not to mention just the consequences of having an influenza infection on physical health. There are some cases where uh, influenza vaccination has been associated with adverse uh, outcomes, particularly in 2009, the H1N1 uh, outbreak, where the pandemic uh, vaccination was associated with uh, a number of new cases of childhood onset narcolepsy, uh, and as, along with potentially a few other presentations as well. Uh, it should be added that, that the numbers of these were really very small indeed. But from a scientific point of view, it's something that we shouldn't really ignore, uh, not least because it tells us that the, there is something at a molecular level going on that probably relates the structure of the influenza virus, uh, whether it's occurring in a sort of uh, natural form or, or within a, virus, uh, a vaccine, and the development of brain-directed autoimmunity afterwards. It should be added that conditions like narcolepsy appeared also to show uh, a bit of an increase in connection with the viral infection, not just with the vaccination uh, itself. So again, the, the, the sort of state of play is not clear, but from a scientific uh, point of view, it's definitely worth pursuing. So it sounds like it's safer, the vaccine is safer rather than ingesting bleach and disinfectants, as uh, Donald said, you know, every year in the month. I mean. yeah. Okay, so, Tom, final question 
for the two million pounds. So we spent half an hour talking about how physiological processes involving you know, viruses and cytokines and all these things, you know, how they are actually affecting people's mental state. So is this therefore the final nail on the coffin for the mind-body dualism supporters? Um. I have to say, I probably don't meet that many sort of self-certified dualists in my day-to-day -day activity, but, and I, and I guess, I mean, maybe in Greece, uh, I don't know, uh, but I guess that the, um, you know, a pandemic is, or any, any fact of biology is not likely to shift the opinion of dualism as a sort of philosophical position, but I think if, you, if, you, if you're sort of referring to an attitude towards the causation of psychiatric illness more generally, then I think there's a lot of interesting stuff that can be taken from this. Um, so, for example, you know, back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, it, it, it appeared that sort of thinking about the causation of psychiatric disorders in terms of, you know, toxic influences, that is sort of physical, environmental influences, um, as well as sort of psychological and social stressors, it was just sort of the way that people thought, and it didn't seem to require a kind of act of philosophical gymnastics. Uh, that you sometimes sort of see, see these days. And then, you know, in the mid 20th century, there was this total pivot away from biological uh, stories uh, of causation to this kind of much more psychoanalytical or psychodynamic approach. This was the era of the sort of schizophrenogenic mother. So I think if anything, the, you know, what these sort of associations reveal to us is that we need to keep everything in, in mind. Um, if you look at uh, some of these maternal immune activation models, um, there's some really interesting work coming out suggesting that these, these animals who experience inflammation when they're in utero, they don't necessarily uh, show symptoms later in life until they're exposed to some kind of stress in adolescence. And some of those stresses in these models are sort of psychological or social stresses uh, and then result in this kind of disease phenotype only in the, the animals who are exposed to inflammation when in utero. So that's a very nice example of how the sort of the very biological and the very sort of psychological can interact. And as a psychiatrist generally, if you just focus too much on the biological or too much on the psychosocial, then you're, you're going to lose the patient. And just like that, 30 minutes just flew by Tom. So hopefully we managed to answer some of your questions, but to be honest, what I hope even more is that we created more questions. Because in the end of the day, who wants all questions in life answered? That would be extremely boring. So next Tuesday at 1 p.m. sharp, I will be joined by Dr. Jonathan Rogers, who will be talking about the neuropsychiatric impact of previous coronavirus outbreaks. No, this is not the first coronavirus outbreak. And what we are learning about the impact of COVID-19. Thank you all so much for joining us today, but most importantly, uh, a massive thank you to you, Tom, uh, for your time and all your amazing work. So now, let's all go back to work. Posco, for more learning, over and out. See you later.